going everyone uh it's been a while <laughs> i swear everything is okay uh it's just been one of those sets of what five months that have been really really just busy and difficult and trying and all that sort of stuff so uh, i wanted to get this out and let you know i've got a few uh interviews coming out i'll be appearing on uh another a podcast or YouTube channel. Uh, more to be announced on that when it gets announced, but I'll be having a uh, major theologian writing a really interesting book on, uh, on uh, evangelical heroes and slavery, so we'll be talking about that. I'll be uh, recording this coming Friday as of the release of this, uh, and so more, more details on that, but that is really, really, I think, quite interesting, quite profound, and quite challenging, so we'll be going through that. But this has been long overdue, and I'm going to try and start doing these more often. It's just, you know, the joke is there's really no such thing as a bivocational preacher who doesn't, you know, who has all the free time in the world. Being a pastor is being a pastor, regardless of what you actually do. So for those who have hung in there, I appreciate it. For those who haven't, well, welcome back, and uh, I hope to get get out some more stuff. And I'm also producing some lectures for... Uh, uh, for an institution and uh, going through that. So if that's of interest to you and you are a patron or have been a patron, uh, I, I, inc I include people who uh, had to stop just for whatever reason they had as patrons in my mind. So, you know, all that stuff is cool. Um, but I've got a few lectures that I'll be putting out on Romans and, and the Pauline Corpus and then on uh, the Johani literature. And so they won't be super, super structured. I mean, they'll be structured enough to be lectures, but, you know, they'll be doing that. So more to come on that uh, by God's grace. And uh, yeah, so uh, I wanted to get this Q&A out. I thought about doing it live, but then I realized I would have to clean up my entire office because <laughs> uh, I, I all that. So it's like, I'm just not going to do that that way. So um, got some breathing room, and I wanted to answer this question from Matt Chisholm of the Bible Borough Down. Go subscribe to him and Billy's channel. Um, go give them some some sub love. Uh, great dudes. Matt's just been an all around just awesome dude. Uh, he appeared on Biblical Rogues Gallery on Trinity Radio uh, once or twice, and it's just it's an absolute blast. So he asked a question that I thought was really helpful. And I did a video on this and did a paper on this and there's lots of stuff out there, but this is a really helpful question. And he asks, all right, I've been saving this one for a while. I have listened to your episodes on it and read your recent paper where you give a definition. My question is this, what the heck is apocalyptic Paul? For the life of me, it sounds like Christianity or it just sounds like Christianity. Explain it to me like I'm five. Uh, well, can do kangaroo so let, let's try this so one um matt you're smart you're not five years old but i will try to i'll try to explain it to my my four-year-old <laughs> with 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 you sitting beside him because otherwise it will just get weird um so okay the apocalyptic paul is a term that is uh helpful but also requires a lot of explanation the question is what is the apocalyptic paul school of thought and so the school of thought comes from folks like, uh, the joke is dead German theologians, Johannes Weiss, um, uh, Albert Schweitzer, who emphasized um, apocalyptic conceptions of Judaism and Paul, that is the belief of uh, cosmological dualism, uh, the idea of, you know, that, that apocalyptic Judaism and, and the New Testament authors operate with uh, dualistic thought, not necessarily anthropological as in body and soul, but in um, sin and death, or sin and, you know, sanctification, light and darkness, life and death, um, uh, and those sorts of kind of dualisms at a cosmological level. And so what the apocalyptic Paul uh, school of thought has tried to emphasize about Paul, and I would actually extend this beyond Paul and into the, the realm of just the New Testament generally, what makes the apocalyptic Paul, the apocalyptic Paul, are kind of these three, th or I would say uh, there's at least several themes that um, must merge together. So think multiple str uh, threads that create a singular strand. The first one is um, an adherence to what we might call um, Christian theology proper. And what I mean by that is um, 
you generally will find within the apocalyptic Paul school a confessional uh, understanding of the Christian faith. And that doesn't mean that they're evangelical, you know, because you got folks from mainline or, or you know, uh, and, and kind of evangelical, you know, you got all these sorts of different persons and groups in that. But one of the things is a, you would say a baseline understanding that Paul's theology is deeply um it deeply formed what we might call basic Christian doctrine. And so it's almost as if you would say, and Matt, I think you're actually right, because I know you've mentioned this before, that it sounds just like Christianity. And that is, and I think that's why I think a lot of people are already fairly favorable to it. And that is why, for example, in the Biblical Rogues Gallery, you have um, Derek Beeler, Will Hess, um, even Leighton Flowers, kind of expressing sympathy with the apocalyptic Paul view, um, on that front, uh, at least as it's been explained. And so on the one hand, it, it, it already is operative with basic Christian doctrine. What we might mean by that is that it's, it's uh, same with like Wesleyan thought, is that it's fundamentally um, Christocentric. Um, Christ goes all the way down, right? And so the, uh, the, the notion is twofold. So uh, you've got Christology being kind of the center of everything. Now, one of the issues in the apocalyptic Paul movement, at least with some criticism of Bart, Karl Bart, was that it was uh, Christomonistic, right? That Christ was Christology was everything, and everything gets collapsed into Christology. And I, I, I would personally reject that. I don't think that's helpful. But the apocalyptic Paul is basically an acceptance, an acceptance, and affirmation that Christian theology and Pauline theology are basically the same thing. To do Pauline theology is to do Christian theology. And so that's thread number one, that Paul's theology is not in opposition to, say, the Nicene Creed or the Apostles' Creed. In fact, it lays the seeds of it specifically. And because it is Christocentric to the core, uh, it begs a sort of question. So if Christology is the, is the means by which we are guided into this point, uh, then the question then becomes, what does Christ reveal about everything? And so for the apocalyptic Paul, excuse me, you, you basically have to ask a different sort of question than what is commonly asked. One of the things that we ask in the apocalyptic Paul school is, how does Christ transform our thinking about the world? That Christ, rather than um, being um, the problem, Christ is the solution, but to what problem? Right. And so it flips the kind of basic Protestant kind of understanding of things that works from um, plight to solution as it kind of is uh, asserted in kind of standard circles. But one of the things here is that the incarnation of Jesus Christ into the world is seen uh, primarily, if not exclusively, as an invasion, as you might think uh, D-Day you know, invading, you know, the, the allies uh, invading the Nazi territory and stuff like that. You So you could think of it that way. Um, but one of the key things that the apocalyptic school emphasizes is that the punctiliar activity of God reframes or reshapes human history and human epistemology. And so to talk about Pauline, or rather apocalyptic Paul, we are talking fundamentally, to, to get to your point, and I'm trying to, I'll explain it more like, like Nolan sitting right here in a moment, but this is just for the folks in the back. You're talking about epistemology, how Paul thinks about the world, and thus by implication how we should think. You're talking about eschatology, how God has acted in his world and will act again in his world. You're talking about Christology, the revelation of God in Christ. And notice revelation and epistemology and eschatology are very similarly interlinked. And then you have soteriology, how does God redeem his fallen world? So those kind of four strands, and sorry for the, 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 the long prelude, but those four strands kind of merge into the apocalyptic Paul. And so apocalyptic Pauline, the, you know, the, apocalyptic Paul theologians and scholars, and I wouldn't call myself a scholar, I'd call myself a theologian, see it as Christ invades the world. He invade the light invades the darkness, as John says. He um, uh, is, 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 is killed, is, is murdered by the principalities and powers, both human and supernatural, and is resurrected by God in vindication of all that Jesus said he was. And so you do have this kind of basic Christian principle that Paul believes in, 
that resurrection is the key by which we understand literally everything, that the resurrection of Jesus Christ confirms the incarnation, it confirms literally everything. And so apocalyptic Pauline theology is incarnational, it's eschatological, it's resurrection grounded, it is literally resurrection, and it is soteriological. But the emphasis is on resurrection as a means, by, as a means to understand everything else. And so um, how Paul thinks about the world, he thinks of the world in terms of sin, of death, of darkness, of corruption, of the degradation of humankind, of creation itself, of our bodies, that we're caught in some sort of cosmic war or cosmic conflict that has implications for our world, you know, and you might think of it as systematic and systemic, individual, personal, and cosmic and corporate. And so evil is everywhere. And so you can see, and apocalyptic Pauline theologians are, are very aware that this has kind of a charismatic or Pentecostal element, has a, um, um, like, me it, it's very compatible with a whole range of, of Christian the uh, theologians or theologies and, and denominations. But the central point is this, whereas the old perspective where the Lutheran Paul sees the, pro sees the problem first, human sin, human guilt, I can't save myself, kind of you know, you might see the provisionist and the Calvinist and, and not all Armenians, but many Armenians kind of ar arguing about that sort of stuff. Whereas the apocalyptic Paul basically steps back and says, you guys are arguing anthropo anthropologically. This is an anthropological question that you guys are asking, which is fine. But for us, God has revealed himself in Jesus Christ as the light of the world, and he gives light to everyone. And he has invaded his world, telling us that the world is fundamentally condemned, fundamentally dark, fundamentally violent, and fundamentally um, has become fundamentally evil, and is in the process of redeeming this world. And so it, it, it affirms basically that sort of framework. And that's where, uh, and it, and it, that's where you get a lot of pushback from, say, um, uh, folks in the or the uh, old perspective or the or kind of the reformational reading of Paul because it essentially argues that sin is not an in individual thing um, or at least an, I would say an individual thing only but it is fundamentally a cosmic supranatural conflict i.e. an entity like death a being of sorts that exercises agency in God's world as a rogue power it's something that is unnatural in God's world in the sense that it is natural to us because we know what it is, but from God's perspective, it's not natural. It is indeed unnatural, and God is actually at war with it, and that's why he reveals himself through resurrection. And so we were talking about revelation, we we're talking about epistemology, we we're talking Christology, and everything flows from Christ. And that is where I think the other understandings of Paul in the New Testament get things very, very wrong. When you focus on anthropocentrism or anthropological questions, Christology takes a back seat to that. Whereas in Old Testament thought, think God revealing himself to Abraham through what I call a prevenient grace, which I tie to Revelation and Christology fundamentally, or God's divine act, you know, God's um, divine activity in Revelation, God revealing God's self to us, um, taking that initial step, as it were, to us. And so... Um, Explaining that like Nolan is sitting here, I would say, um, the creator God of all things, of you, of me, of Matt, of mom, of grandma, of grandpa, of your friends at, at school, of the friends you, we have at church, this creator God made all things. And when he originally made all things, all things were good. And then when he made us as human beings, it was very good. And yet these very good things went rogue and went wrong, thinking that they did not need God in their lives, that they could do things independent or separate from God, not realizing that this God, the God of their very life, their very being, um, was also their source of life. And when they severed themselves from his relational source or power, we began to remove ourselves from the very source of life entirely. And our struggle then became of sin, of death, of separation, of shame, of racism, of sexism, of consumerism, of war, of famine, of exploitation and oppression, violence, slander, greed, all of that stuff. You might think that the body that was created was good, 
but then someone, an outside rogue power, we would call this rogue power or being Satan and his fallen angels or his, his own demonic divine counsel, so to speak. A little bit of hyzer there for folks. And what you have then is a world that was originally created very good becoming very not good. And so what God does, Father, Son, and Spirit, is that is the Son comes into the world as born in human flesh, taking on uh, the human experience perfectly and fully, is touched in every way by sin, and that is culminated at the cross in a judicial murder, but was himself pure and innocent and holy as God is pure and innocent and holy. And yet God is killed. Jesus is killed. The Son is killed. The one who invaded the darkened world as the light is killed. But the light, as we know, could not be turned off. You cannot turn off the light. And what happens is that God raised this light back from the dead, and his name is Jesus. And he is raised victorious above every principality, ruler, and power, whether human, political, or supernatural, or all of that. He stands enthroned as the life giver instead of the principality of death and sin and Satan. And so what we have now is the dispensing of the spirit or the sending of the spirit that gives us the body of Christ, that puts us all together, that knits us together into a community of faith that seeks to serve this God and God's world. Where we look at human history, not as the end of the story, but as points of time where God has acted and thankfully and um, yeah, and thankfully God has acted perfectly and definitively in his son Jesus Christ who is both the messianic um, hope and promise of the people of Israel as well as the savior of the world and this God reveals himself to everyone so that all people might know believe in him trust in him give their lives to him and live embodied lives of holiness and righteousness and mercy and justice. And so the apocalyptic Paul is, I think, fundamentally the, a Christian reading of Paul that affirms a Trinitarian um, construct. And I don't mean construct as something that was made, but a, but a reading of scripture that is fundamentally Trinitarian. It also views justification by faith, not just as a simple act of propositional belief, but as an embodied holy life. That faith is not just a thing you do in the mind. It is a it is a lifestyle. It is life itself in many ways. That justification is a declaration of liberation. That you are essentially emancipated from the powers and enslaving reality of sin and evil and death and all of that. And thus, the apocalyptic Paul is grounded in Trinitarianism, uh, liberation, and eschatological hope. And that God will eventually one day judge the living and the dead and his kingdom and no other kingdom will have no end. His kingdom is eternal, perfect and holy as the garden and the very good were intended to be. So the apocalyptic Paul is in many ways just, I think, a summation of Christian theology um, that emphasizes God's irrevocable and sudden and shocking invasion back into the world upending human history, challenging it, and then ultimately redeeming it. And so I don't know if that helps, but that is kind of the big picture. Um, not every apocalyptic Paul theologian would agree with every point, but I do think that there is a very strong element of that reality and that there are broad themes here that all would affirm, at least in, in principle, even if they might, you know, tweak it a little bit here and there. But uh, I, I, I think... Think of it in terms of Trinitarian liberation from the darkness and the powers and sin and death. And so the war motifs are there. The cosmological motifs are there. The political themes are there. And it's more, I think, a more holistic way of reading Paul than I think the old perspective, the new perspective, which does not exist, and the Paulithan Judaism school and all the other schools as well. And these are not all necessarily mutually exclusive as if, as if there's nothing good or, 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 or intelligible about the other perspectives. But the apocalyptic Paul school of thought, at least in my mind, 
is the best way of reading Paul. And of course, if you picked up on it, there's a strong Christus Victor element. There's, I would argue there's a substitutionary element to it, whether or not you affirm the penal aspect of that is up for debate. Um, but you can see there are those sorts of themes as well. So it's, and I think prevenient grace theologically makes great sense of all of that as well, that no one is left without some sort of witness or light, as John 1 says, um, from God saving and offering the world to the people, world to people. So I don't know if that helps. I think the apocalyptic Paul is essentially the, is a Christian Paul, not to say other people are not Christian, but I'm talking specifically about reading Paul from the position and perspective of Christian dogmatic theology dogmatic meaning um, ecclesial theology church theology stuff the church has believed for a long time not every church father or church mother but i think you can see at least at the initial stages that there are lots of pieces that flow together that um, at the end of the day come forth i think very nicely from this perspective and this perspective kind of summarizes all of these points so matt and and nolan what the heck is the apocalyptic paul it is the Paul of faith. It is the historical Paul as well, <laughs> but is primarily, but it is primarily, but not exclusively, the Paul of faith of Christian faith. That Paul was a Messianic Jewish apocalyptic theologian who understood that time had become nullified, that human history had been summarized, and that the future was purely um, Christotelic. Everything in God's world was Christotelic, going towards the end, going towards a specific goal in the future. And that is, of course, the Christian hope. And that provides the grounds for missions. It provides the grounds for holiness. It provides the grounds for baptism and so on and so forth. And so I don't know if that helps, but I hope that at least gives a little bit more uh, strands or rather threads to create a more helpful strand. Let me know what y'all think. Um, a really helpful book on this that I've been going through. It's about 200 or so pages. It's just called The Apocalyptic Paul by Jamie Davies. Or I think it's Davies. 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 I'm looking at it on my shelf. The Davies, yes. He's out. He's a, uh, he's a British New Testament scholar. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Very helpful book. Um, traces kind of the historical development of this, this perspective um, and so on and so forth. So, yeah, I don't know if that helps. Um, trying to avoid, I mean, I had to, I had to use the, the goofy jargon and stuff like that, but hopefully that at least paints a, a bigger picture. I tried doing this in five minutes or seven minutes, whatever it turned out to be. And I was like, ah, that's just not gonna, there's so much more that could be said, but anyway, let me know what else needs to be said. Share this video, comment on it. Let me know what y'all think. Um, you can see my interaction in the biblical, uh, the live streams over at Trinity radio on the biblical rogues gallery, where you can kind of see my reading of say Romans three and Romans one. Um, and other sorts of texts, and we're getting into Romans 5 now, so I encourage you to go over, subscribe to the channel, make sure you ring that bell so you can do all that. If you like what you saw here and uh, want to keep me accountable, become a patron. It's free. I have it set up so that you can become a free patron. I, I don't want to... I'd love a few extra bucks. That would be an absolute delight. I got ETS coming up, and I'm hoping to present a paper on this subject, uh, specifically in Romans 5. But yeah, as, as the spirit leads do. But at the end of the day, comment on this. Let me know what you think. And if there are further questions, throw them in there and I will do my best to answer them. So the Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. May his face shine upon you. And um, go love him in apocalyptic truth and holiness because, well, anyone can do that. And we should do all that. God bless everyone.